It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. My name is Kelly Toops. I'm the Director of Nutrition at Old Ways, and we're so excited to bring you this webinar, The Honey Effect, Honeybees Impact on Our Food Supply and Honey in the Mediterranean Diet. So before we get started, I'm just gonna go over um, a few housekeeping notes. Um, so yes, we are recording this session. And we will be sending you the slides as well as the recording um, within one week of when the webinar is over. And you can uh, also view the slides and recording on your own time on our website, oldwayspt.org slash CPEU. And we will have time to do question and answer at the end of this session. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box in Zoom. Uh, we definitely prefer the chat over the Q&A function. And then we hope you can join us at our next webinar, um, which is next month about raw milk cheese. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over um, to our lovely moderator so that we can get started. Well, welcome to our webinar. I'm Barbara Lyle. I'm the Consulting Director for Nutrition at the National Honey Board, and I'm excited to moderate this webinar today where we'll share with you information about honeybees' impact on the food supply and honey in the Mediterranean diet. These are two areas that as registered dietitians, you probably get questions from patients, clients, and shoppers. So with that, we're going to take a little step back in time historically and this slide actually shows an 8,000 year old rock painting discovered in a cave in Valencia, Spain, depicting a person climbing a ladder to gather honey. So this shows that um, way back from the beginning of history, uh, we have humans that were really in the hunting and gathering stage well before farming and domesticated animals, and yet they were um, using honey both as a food and probably also as uh, a traditional remedy. So our webinar today is going to explore not only how honeybees impact our food supply, but also the art of, of beekeeping and how honey is made, because it's really part of the full picture as consumers are making decisions about honey. Um, then we'll also share insights specifically about how honey can be paired with foods in order to help more Americans eat a healthy Mediterranean style diet. And the magic here really is that honey can be part of the culinary traditions that, uh, that help the foods that we want to see people eat more of actually taste great. So before I uh, transition here to a little bit of background on honey itself, I do want to just recognize and thank the National Honey Board for sponsoring this session. All right, on the first slide or next slide here, I just want to quickly show you so as you're listening to the talks, you have this background. Uh, what is honey's nutrition profile? So it is sugar. That's what it is primarily. There is some water, there's also a small amount of vitamins and minerals, and there's also some unique uh, carbohydrates that may have prebiotic type activity. Uh, you might've heard in the news things about some of the rare and uniquely metabolized sugars. Those are down there in that section called 4.2% of other carbohydrates. Um, and there's also organic acids, interestingly, uh, which has a role in baking, by the way. So and kind of a nifty fact to know there. Um, so that's what honey looks like. Um, it is versatile, it's varied in taste and composition, it has 60 calories per tablespoon serving. So if you're eating a full tablespoon, you're getting 60 calories, but if you're eating a much smaller amount closer to what maybe a serving of table sugar would look like, which is usually labeled at a teaspoon, you're getting um, even less calories, obviously. So all in all, from a nutrition perspective, it is a pure and all natural sweetener that in moderation fits into the balanced diet. Uh, the National Honey Board has actually made a commitment starting back in 2018 to fund some more human nutrition research on some of the unique bioactive components uh, like the antioxidants or some of these unique sugars. Um, and you get a chance to hear a little bit about one of the projects that's being funded today, which is some work that Francine Overcash, one of our speakers, is doing about the role of honey in helping promote a Mediterranean style diet. 
So next slide, please. In summary, to kick us off, what you'll learn today is the connection between eating honey and bee health the impact and importance of honeybees in agriculture, and how the current American diet aligns as a med uh, with the Mediterranean-style diet with the emphasis on foods that could help people do a better job at eating that style diet. And finally, I'll introduce our speakers, and we'll get right on to hearing from them. Um, the next slide, please. First off, we'll have um, Danielle Downey, who is the executive director of Project uh, APSM, and she's worked with honeybees for over 25 years in many places. Uh, Francine Overcash will be talking about the Mediterranean diet um, style work that she's doing, and she's a lecturer at the University of Minnesota, where she currently focuses on behaviorally driven research to improve nutrition in diverse populations. And finally, we have Margaret um, Lombard here, who is the executive director of the National Honey Board, because we already know from questions you submitted when you registered for this um, session that you have some questions just plain about types of honey and how honey is made. So she has graciously, graciously accepted the offer to be here to answer some questions that come up as well. Again, just to emphasize, I'll be watching the chat and I'll be uh, taking questions and grouping them together. So if you don't hear it exactly asked the way you wrote it, it may be that I uh, bundled it up with some other questions, uh, but we will get to as many of them as we can. So with that, I'm going to hand this off to our first speaker, Danielle. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Can you see me and see the slide fine? We can. Very good. So I'm Danielle Downey. Um, as Barbara mentioned, I'm the executive director of an organization called Project Apis M. Uh, Apis mellifera is the Latin name for the insect you all know as the honeybee. So my organization is really focused on this one species of bee uh, that we use to pollinate our foods and produce honey. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the honeybee and how it fits into agriculture and producing honey. Uh, some of my research at Project APSM is funded by the National Honey Board. 5% of their budget goes into production research, which is mostly uh, bee health issues these days. So I'll show you a little bit more about that later. But most of my talk today is going to be introducing you to the honeybee and why we should all uh, care so much about this little critter um, and talk to you about the many parts of our diet that rely on honeybees for pollination. So it's not just about honey, it's about the fruits and vegetables that they pollinate. This is actually a critical agricultural event, and I'm going to give you an idea about the scale of that. Um, and you've all heard that the honeybee is facing a lot of stress these days, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about how that situation is and what we're doing to help. So first off, an abridged history of uh, the honeybee, Apis mellifera. So as you saw, they've been managed for many thousands of years, uh, or, or at least interacted with humans. Um, the advent of creating a box that they live in, which you may have seen on road size, is a more modern uh, way of keeping bees. But humans have interacted with bees for many thousands of years. Um, they are not native to North America. They were actually brought here by people that came here in 1600 to have them for honey and for wax, which is also an important product we get from the hive. And in um, the years after that, they were moved to Utah and to California. So there are several events where honeybees were moved around the continent, but they're not actually native here. Uh, there are people who make a living with commercial beekeeping. There's not a lot of them. We're probably the, the bulk of the bees kept and managed in the US or pollinating crops and producing honey is uh, on the order of hundreds to thousands of people. So not, not nearly as many as other kinds of farming. And their revenue streams have really changed in the last 30 years or so. So it used to be that beekeepers kept bees to produce honey. And now because it's become so important and the demand for pollinating crops has gone so much, um, has increased so much, Many beekeepers now get most of their revenue from renting bees to pollinate crops on contracts. Uh, you probably have heard about colony collapse disorder, and I'll, there is a, a, a lot of media about this suite of problems in honeybee colonies that was identified all in a year 
in 2007. Um, and they did characterize those problems, but they haven't really seen it since. The good part to come of that is that we got a lot of really detailed looks uh, about censusing the health of bees. And we looked at the um, problems. And since then, although we don't see a lot of colony collapse disorder since then, the losses of colonies every year it hovers around 30 to 40%. So out of 100 colonies, 30 to 40 of them die every year and beekeepers are having to replace those colonies to keep their businesses solvent. So bees, bee health um, is a pretty big deal for beekeepers, but also for us because we rely on them. So pollination matters for farmers, for consumers and in our natural environment. Bees actually pollinate a lot of foods in that we enjoy and uh, to the tune of about 35%. So you've heard one in three bites of food relies on a bee. That's 90 different crops and it's mostly fruits and vegetables. So uh, the, the impact that it can have for the plant is that you can get earlier fruits, you get larger, more symmetrical fruits. So on the screen here, you see a picture from my own garden of zucchinis and there's six zucchinis in there and really one or two of them is pollinated well, and these others, you can see the problems, those are all just from inadequate, insufficient pollination. So the, the symmetry of the fruit and how it develops really relies on those bees to pollinate it. Um, the nutritional differences, also the profile changes with pollination. Uh, there's studies in apples and pears that show how that changes. And you can see in these strawberries that um, obviously, if you want to, to grow and market fruit to the consumer, you want the nice, well-developed fruit. And not only does it look better and more desirable, but it actually can have a much longer shelf life and be a, um, a firmer fruit with better pollination. So maybe you didn't know how much it impacts the, uh, the actual quality of the food that we eat. One example that I'm going to give you of the demand for pollination is this graph, which shows almonds. So you can see from 2010 to 2025, the blue line is the number of colonies we expect to need to pollinate the almond crop in California. And that's based on needing two hives per acre to pollinate an orchard of almonds. The number of honeybee colonies, although they um, have heavy losses every year. Beekeepers have been consistently rebuilding that number. So it's been pretty steady. Um, obviously, you can imagine that increases the cost and reduces the margin of success for a commercial beekeeping business because the inputs are increasing. But they've been able to hold their ground, although the number of almond trees being planted is growing. And so we predict, based on all of this data, that the number of bees that we need, uh, we're going to be using all of them by about 2023. So you can see that as agriculture increases, um, the, the pollination demand is, is continuing to increase too. So this is just in one crop, but from almonds, bees go to apples and cherries and uh, plums and a lot of other fruits and, and seed crops actually that, that require pollination in order to keep that farmer's crop productive. So you may not have thought of it this way either, but the plants themselves actually really need the bees. So on the bottom, you see a, a cereal, maybe that's a cornflower, but um, grains and, and corn, um, rice, these are wind pollinated plants. So although this looks not much at all like a flower that we're used to, this is the reproductive part of the plant where the, the pollination happens and no insect is required to do that. But on the top, you see a, a common Peruvian lily that you can pick up in the grocery store. If I were with you in person today, I would make each of you pull one of these apart so you can just uh, enjoy the many wonderful adaptations that the plants use to attract and compete for pollinators. So of these six petals here, you can see three of them have markings and are actually almost like a runway to attract the bee. Um, this, the scent and the colors of flowers are really just to compete and attract pollinators. And when the bee walks into this flower, she often will go by these parts that hold the pollen and her body is touching those plant parts and moving the reproductive 
pollen from one flower to the next in order to fertilize the fruit or the seed. And often the nectar that is at the bottom of these, and actually if you dissect one of these, you'll see these two um, modified petals are a tube. And in the bottom of that tube, you'll find a drop of nectar. So the plant is actually attracting the bee, guiding it in. And for her to get that reward, she has to go past the reproductive parts of the plant that it needs for that, that ecosystem service. And the only reason plants produce nectar is for the pollinator reward. So think about that. Like the honey that we enjoy is really just the plant's reward for the insects that visit and, and perpetuate its reproduction. There's a lot of other ways that bees see the world that we don't have any uh, way of knowing and that's UV patterns. Uh, so these flowers, you can see there's a, a photographer that takes ultraviolet photography of of flowers and there's a lot going on. On this top one, this is a dandelion and the bee sees it completely differently. Uh, there are also magnetic fields around a flower that a bee is sensitive to. She has hairs on her body that are sensitive to electric charges. They help her collect pollen. And sometimes a bee can sense that the flower has already been visited or not. And they use these signals in order to be efficient about their plant pollination. And this is another extreme example that I like to show. This is an orchid, and here is the orchid bee that, that pollinates the, um, a plant, this orchid plant. And this bee actually um, is attracted to the plant from its fragrance, but also the profile looks like the female bee, and the male bee comes and tries to mate with that flower, uh, and the flower trips this little pollination mechanism is almost like a physical trigger and it smacks this pollinia onto the, the back of the bee that flies to the next flower and tries to mate with it and ends up pollinizing that plant, which is a pretty remarkable and intimate relationship. So there's a lot going on between bees and plants. And this results in the pollination of many of our favorite foods, the fruits, the vegetables, um, the colorful foods, Many of these re rely on bees for pollination. And you may not realize it, but so we see, for example, onions on this list. And you don't think of an onion as a fruit or a seed, but for people to grow onions, there needs to be an onion field that is pollinated to produce seeds for the next year's farmer to plant onions. This is also true for alfalfa, um, which connects bees closely to the production of dairy and beef cattle because they need that seed. So to transition to the honey part of what, which is a, a, a marvelous byproduct of all of this plant and bee business. And the bees are little vegetarians. They get everything they need from the plants that they pollinate. And here you see a bee and she has pollen on her legs and a sunflower, which is a great source of, of pollen for her, and also a good way for you to observe pollinators in your own yard. If you plant sunflowers, it's, it's, it's like a little uh, screen into the world of pollinators that visit. So she gathers up that pollen while she's looking for the nectar. The pollen is their protein source, which they need to take and produce offspring and, and build more bees. And the nectar is their carbohydrate source. So they use that and burn it like gasoline to fly around and forage and, and do the work that they do. And they also process this nectar and store it in their pantry uh, to produce honey. So although we see bees on flowers, the only ones that we see are the worker bees. And the workers are all female. And inside of the box at home, the bee box or the, the hollow tree um, where the, the bees would normally live if they weren't managed, you have three kinds of bees. The colony itself is considered a super organism and it's composed of one queen and she's this cartoon in the middle is the queen. Here's a photo of a queen with a number tag glued on her back because she's um, identified by the beekeeper as a, a certain queen. And these are the workers around her. So the queen and the workers are female. And this bee over here is a drone. And this is the male. Um, he's a little bit more robust. His eyes are much bigger. And the, the queen lays all the eggs. She doesn't really leave the colony. Um, her sole job is to reproduce. 
the workers can't reproduce, but they do all of the work. So those are all female and they do the foraging and feed the babies and build the nest and defend the nest. And the drones fly and, and mate with other queens outside of the hive. Um, so they all have their job and none of them can survive without all of the other contingents. So this is a super organism. And this is important because to go through winter, they need um, many thousands of individuals and there's nothing to eat and it's very cold. And so the, the reason that bees produce honey is to go through winter en masse. And so they huddle together and they eat that honey that they have stored and they burn it and shiver their flight muscles to generate heat. And the queen stays in the middle where they keep her warm. And for several months that honey sustains them until there's more floral resources and they can begin again to build their colony back up in spring. So beekeepers have, have taken the surplus honey. Bees need about 100 pounds of honey to get through winter. And beekeepers have chosen stocks that produce many hundreds of pounds um, if, if it's available on the landscape. And they take the surplus and of course leave enough for the bees to, to survive so that they can have them again the next year. And that honey surplus is what we enjoy at the supermarket. And as you can imagine, there's as many kinds of honey as there are flowers. So the, the, the honey is gonna be different depending on where it comes from and what the floral source is. You see dark honey, light honey, um, very pungent honeys and very mild honeys. And even in the US, there's probably hundreds of honeys available. And the National Honey Board, if you wanna try varietals of honey, you can use this honey locator on their website and find various honeys throughout the US to taste and try. So bees are under a lot of pressure. Uh, we call it the four Ps. We have parasites and this is a, a mite, which is a kind of like a tick. It, it feeds on the, the juices of the bee, it pokes a hole and it serves almost like a dirty needle and vectors viruses when it moves from one bee to the next and feeds. So this parasite pathogen complex and this is an introduced pest. Um, it has been probably the worst thing to happen to bees in our lifetime. But they also suffer from poor nutrition. So as you can imagine, the landscape is changing. There's a lot of development. There's a lot of monocrops. And not everything that happens and changes on the landscape makes it a better world for bees. Uh, and so it's harder for, for bees to make their living in the world because they need more flowers. And in general, we're going the direction of less flowers. And of course, pesticides uh, can be harmful to bees. And as agriculture increases, so does pest management for those crops. And so these are all the pressures that are mounting on honeybees impacting their health and well being. So, Project APSM is a nonprofit that funds bee research for the honeybee. And the National Honey Board is an important partner in this. And the way that we're helping is to put money into good scientific research about how to solve some of these problems, how beekeepers can manage and improve uh, their uh, bee health in, in their management schemes. So this is a profile of some of the projects that we have funded. And the other thing that we're doing, which is really important, is giving bees better nutrition. And for nutrition in bees, that's flowers. And so we know we can reach a lot of bees when they come out here to pollinate almonds. Over 2 million colonies are moved in trucks to pollinate almonds, and then they disperse to other places to pollinate crops early in the spring. And then in the summer, where most of the honey is produced, many of the commercial bees are moved to summer ground to produce a honey crop. And we know that we can reach a lot of bees here by putting more flowers on the landscape. So we have these two programs, Seeds for Bees, which is blooming cover crops around almonds, and the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, which replenishes uh, floral diversity on the landscape around agriculture in the upper Midwest. So people often want to know how they can help um, protecting and investing in the landscape and the floral resources. Bees need flowers, and if you plant flowers, and if you protect flowers, and if you hold off from poisoning flowers, I mean, the, the dandelion that you see as a weed or that you spray, that's the best thing that a bee can find in the springtime. So it's, um, it's really balancing 
our needs with, with a landscape that can support healthy pollinators. Uh, buying honey is really important. These bees produce the honey and the surplus must be removed in order for them to stay healthy and have room to make more bees. And so it's almost like um, when you milk a cow, then the, the, the cow stays healthier. It has this crop. If you buy honey, then the beekeeper has a strong market for their product. The they can reinvest in healthy bees. And it is a, it's a good thing to, to have a strong honey market and the bees produce the honey and um, produce more than they need. And you can also support organizations that do work like PAM does. Uh, Project APSM takes donations to support our research and to replenish the habitat. So we are happy to be the conduit to make a positive change for bees. So with that, I'd like to hand over a slide control to Dr. Francine Overcash to talk about uh, the honey diet side of this. Thank you so much, Danielle. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so I'm excited to present this research investigation that I'm working on with the National Honey Board. We're still not seeing your slides, Francine. Could you try oh. sharing one more time? Yes, share, there we go. Okay, there we go. And now. Perfect. Yes, sorry about that. Okay, so yes, I'm excited to present my research with the National Honey Board, working, um, looking at honey as a helper for Americans to more closely follow a Mediterranean diet style pattern. And this is just my disclosure statement. So I want to start this presentation with a topic everyone on this webinar is all too familiar with, and it basically defines the central problem driving this research investigation. And that is the fact that most Americans do not follow the dietary guidelines. And since the dietary guidelines um, are the main, are what are determined to help lead the most healthful life, that is preventative disease, um, we need to figure out, you know, how to better meet these guidelines. And in this particular slide, the healthy eating index was used. As you all know, um, being RDs, that the healthy eating index is a score that measures adherence to the dietary guidelines, you know, in a range from zero to 100, the closer the score is to 100, the closer the person follows the dietary guidelines. So since the dietary guidelines are not being met by most Americans, what do the experts suggest that we do in order to better meet them? Their answer is to improve your overall dietary pattern. And I know you guys all know the last two iterations, the 2015 and 2020 versions, they did focus in, on improving your overall dietary patterns. And why dietary patterns? So this shift was um, towards patterns and away from focusing on individual nutrients acknowledges that an individual's dietary pattern is a more accurate depiction of their overall dietary choices and behaviors, and that foods aren't and nutrients aren't consumed in isolation. For example, older versions of the guidelines focused on increasing fiber or decreasing saturated fats. But the 2020 version just released this past December went even further and recommended three specific patterns that they named the healthy US dietary pattern, the healthy vegetarian pattern, and the healthy Mediterranean style dietary pattern. So this next slide is just illustrates that all three patterns emphasize the importance of the same food groups, which are seen here. But there are differences. Specifically, how exactly does a Mediterranean style pattern differ from the other two? In general, compared to the healthy US dietary pattern, the Mediterranean diet pattern has higher intakes of fruit, higher intakes of seafood, lower intakes of dairy, and the use of olive oil as the primary source of fat. And the vegetarian dietary pattern, as the name implies, is solely plant-based. So naturally recommends higher plant based goals. 
So as we continue to focus on the Mediterranean diet, I just wanted to briefly mention its history within American culture. And because we're all in nutrition, I know you're familiar with Ansel Key's landmark seven country study in the 1950s that found strikingly low incidence of coronary heart disease and other chronic diseases in populations of the Mediterranean region. But what's so impressive about Keyes' study is that the cardioprotective effects have strongly sustained in hundreds of studies in the decades following. And they've even, the results have even been broadened to other health outcomes, including certain cancers, cognitive impairment, and other neurodegenerative diseases. And this has been as recently um, reported in a 2018 really robust meta-analysis of the literature. And here's another familiar image to you all. It's the Mediterranean diet pyramid. This version was developed by Old Ways in partnership with the Harvard School of Public Health and the World Health Organization. Which brings me to the focus of my investigation. Um, and that seeks to offer even more specific ways to increase consumption of foods that characterize the Mediterranean diet. We wanted to answer a question maybe not previously considered that how can we help Americans consume those foods that are characteristically more Mediterranean diet foods? And the novel agent that we chose to focus on is honey. So to answer the question, can honey be successfully used to increase consumption of foods that align well with a Mediterranean style dietary pattern? And as Danielle and Barbara mentioned, honey has long been since the, you know, the primary sweetener since ancient times, including of course the Mediterranean regions. So it's the logical sweetener of choice for modern Mediterranean diets as well. A little, a little sweetness from honey, as we know, goes a long way. Um, for example, honey can provide a sweet, of hint, a sweet hint to help dull any bitter taste of certain vegetables like asparagus or broccoli. And for instance, in whole grains, honey's sweetness can help counter the bitterness of some of those varieties as well. It's arguably arguable, we all know that the most important factor for deciding what to eat is taste. And honey can help with the palatability and taste of some key Mediterranean foods. So taking all of the above into consideration, this led me to the primary objective of this research endeavor, which is to ultimately identify honey food pairings that we believe will promote alignment with the Mediterranean style dietary pattern as recommended by the most recent guidelines. So in order to accomplish this first, I wanted to determine specific foods that may be most predictive of alignment to a Mediterranean style diet pattern in the US. And then I was gonna use, I'm gonna use these foods to create the honey food pairings. So it's hypothesized that these honey food pairings may help the general population eat more of a Mediterranean style diet. To begin with, I needed to first find a study population with sound dietary data which brought me of course to the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey that we all know is in and Haynes. And as you know, this is the data set that's the primary source of all studies, most studies that determine nutrition policy in this country. And in order to have the largest sample possible, we kept the eligibility um, criteria pretty broad. We searched it only by age, 25 to 65. And if they had two complete and reliable dietary recalls. So once I had the right data set, I needed to first understand how well current American diets align with this Mediterranean diet pattern. In order to do this, adherence should be measured quantitatively. So this requires a Mediterranean diet score system, much like the healthy HEI, the healthy eating index, measures alignment to the guidelines. There are actually quite a few of Mediterranean diet pattern scoring systems out there um, that have been used for the years since the seven country study. However, one scoring index stood out as the most relevant or best fitting to Amer the American population. And that is the Mediterranean style dietary pattern score. 
This was developed by a group from Harvard um, with the aim, they had the aim to overcome shortfalls of previous scoring systems that measured Mediterranean diet adherence. First, this group sought to create a scoring index that accounted for a diet consisting of both traditional and non-traditional Mediterranean diet foods. And this was basically so that the scores would more accurately reflect alignment in um, the certain food cultures outside the Mediterranean region. This is the US, right? <laughs> Secondly, previous scoring indices did not consider the negative implications of overconsumption. And so as a result, adherence to the Mediterranean diet may have been achieved simply by consuming greater amounts of those Mediterranean diet foods. And I think it's this aspect that is particularly relevant to American populations because overconsumption of certain foods, as we all know, is common and failure to account for overconsumption may very well result in inaccurate scores. This table shows the 13 scoring components that comprise the Mediterranean style dietary pattern score. So for each group, the Mediterranean diet pyramid recommends the number of daily or weekly servings an individual should aim to consume. And you see in this table, it's the second column um, called criteria for maximum score of 10. So score is calculated for each of the 13 components by multiplying the number of servings that a person consumes by the number of points for that specific food component. The exception is olive oil, which assigns a zero for no use of olive oil, a five for olive oil used along with other types of fats and oils, and a 10 for sole use of olive oil. But it doesn't end there. None of, one of the other main advantages is in this next step. So once the number of servings is consumed is multiplied by the number of appropriate number of points, the score for each component is then decreased one point for every serving over the recommended amount. As such, the lowest possible score for each food component could be zero if food uh, overconsumption was over 100% of the recommended amounts. And here's the entire formula laid out for the, um, the scoring algorithm. I think seeing the layout of the formula better shows the other advantage of this scoring index, which um, is use of the weighted proportion of energy intake of Mediterranean foods over total energy intake. The use of this proportion is how this score better applies to regions outside the Mediterranean region. And you'll see this example um, at the bottom. It basically shows the scores of each of the 13 components are summed, then standardized, and then multiplied by that proportion of energy derived from traditional Mediterranean diet foods over total energy consumed. And in the example, it looks like this person consumed Mediterranean foods that accounted for 65% of their total energy um, that ultimately resulted with a total score of 46.5. So just to recap, this Mediterranean style diet pattern score accounts for overconsumption and percent of energy from Mediterranean diet foods which then again makes it more appropriate for the American population. Here's the basic flow chart depicting the research methodology. You can see the very first steps is basically how the calculation of the scoring system is ultimately leads into how honey can help increase consumption of Mediterranean diet foods. <clears throat> first, um, the all eligible participants are divided into two categories based on their scores. And those scores are divided into the top 25% and, of, and then that means adherence level to the Mediterranean diet and versus the bottom 75% and we call them the general population. And so what happens next is the foods consumed among this top 25% will be carefully analyzed. And that's because the foods of this top group, it's believed they are predicative of the greater adherence to this Mediterranean style diet pattern, and also suggests that there's a higher acceptance among Americans. They already eat them. 
And so these foods in the top, identified in the top scores, will be used for the honey food pairings that it's hypothesized will ultimately encourage Americans to consume more traditional Mediterranean diet foods and align better with a Mediterranean diet pattern. I wanted to point out that's shown here in the layout that the final stages of this research endeavor are plans to further quantify our results via a dietary modeling analysis. So in a nutshell, I plan to conduct a substitution modeling analysis of the honey food pairings in the general population to see how it impacts their scores. So these next few slides are our results thus far. Thus far. Um, bear in mind, I'm in the preliminary phases and hope to have more information by the end of the year, hopefully in the form of a publication. So first some demographics. In the interest of time, I'm just gonna present um, demographics of the top scoring group um, because their food intake is what we're interested in. In total, just under 20,000 participants were eligible for the analysis, and the majority of these top scores were 40 and female. Here we see that there's a relatively good representation of the major race and ethnicity groups, although there are a little more non-Hispanic white participants. And then we see the poverty to income ratio, which is a well-reported socioeconomic metric. It's pretty evenly distributed as well as body mass index. And so here are the fi main findings thus, thus far. So you'll see again, for the, this scoring pattern, it's out of a hundred. And as you can see, both groups fall short of being well aligned with the Mediterranean diet. I'm inclined to say, you know, it's disappointing, but maybe not so surprising, especially if you consider that the number one co-mortality co and comorbidities of Americans are cardio related. And of course the Mediterranean diet is understood to have cardioprotective effects. And because we're in the first stages of this complex analysis, I've been able to glean that overconsumption is a problem in this country. And I can already see for many, many participants, their score for certain food components was, was zero for overconsumption. And because honey is the focus of this investigation, I also wanted to estimate how many reported eating honey. Um, and as you can see, there are definitely more honey eaters in the top scoring groups compared to the general population, which is suggestive that we may be onto something using honey as a helper. Again, but bear in mind <laughs> these honey consumption numbers, you know, NHANES does use 22, 24 hour dietary recalls. And so, you know, dietary recalls may not truly reflect um, regular use of honey, right? But it's a good start for sure. <laughs> and so this next slide is a word cloud that we think helps depicts the most commonly consumed foods among the top scores. You may not be surprised at the food shown here, especially because the data thus far is suggestive that most Americans could use significant improvement in the quest to meet the Mediterranean diet. Um, I think the big takeaway here is that very few foods are here are traditional Mediterranean diet foods. The few on here are pretty far down the list, like salmon, whole grains, even olive oil. So given the findings as far, here are some practices that may be helpful in your messages to your clients. We're following a Mediterranean diet, maybe a goal. The first three bullets have to do with traditional Mediterranean foods, but are consumed at levels below recommendations. So for example, increasing fish over other protein foods, increasing non-starchy vegetables, and increasing olive oil in the diet would help boost their alignment. At the same time, there are a number of foods in the current diet that um, even among those who score highest that are overconsumed, Our preliminary findings suggest decreasing red and processed meats like prepackaged deli meats and hot dogs, um, also decreasing white potatoes, decreasing dairy foods like milk and cheese, and top sources of decreasing top sources of um, added sugar, which in this is sodas and energy drinks, would help improve their Mediterranean diet scores. 
So again, these are just preliminary findings that strongly support the need for improvement for all Americans to consume more Mediterranean diet foods at the recommended levels. And these pictures, um, we felt they depict simple swaps of traditional Mediterranean diet foods for those commonly consumed less healthy choices. For example, you know, swap a grain salad with veggies for a starchy vegetable, or of course, salmon for red meat that is definitely overconsumed in this country. And then olive oil dressing um, and a leafy green salad instead of a creamy dressing. And as stated, we are pursuing the idea that honey is a culinary helper that can inspire consumers to make these dietary changes. And so these images here are illustrative of how honey can be used in those simple swaps. And including honey in simple swaps may make the foods more palatable and therefore easier to incorporate in their diet. And pictured here are just a few examples. Um, an easy sheet pan salmon dinner with herb and olive oil and honey chimichurri sauce with vegetables, quinoa tabbouleh salad with honey roasted carrots um, that can be made ahead of time. So I'll conclude again by reiterating there is more to come from this research endeavor. Ultimately, we anticipate the results from this project will help clarify to the average American that simple food substitutions of food pairings with honey will help with taste and then ultimately help them better meet the Mediterranean guidelines, diet, following a Mediterranean style diet pattern. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Francine. With that, um, I'll ask Margaret, Francine, Danielle, all to go off of mute. Um, as I said, we had several questions that came in in advance, so I've kind of grouped some questions together. And if you don't hear your question exactly the way you worded it, hopefully you get the answer because I'm going to embed some of these uh, together. So to start with, um, I'd like to go to Margaret and have her handle some of the questions that came in up front about forms of honey. Uh, I'll list a few here and you can answer them. And if we miss one, we'll come back. But how is organic honey obtained and how does it compare to conventional honey? Is regular conventional honey pasteurized? And I think, let's just start with that. How about those two? Frame it up. Okay, terrific. And thank you to Danielle and Francine for the presentations. Really um, inspiring and informational. So we really appreciate your help today. Thank you for that and Barbara for being our MC here today. So um, organic honey, um, where does it come from? How do we get it? So to be certified organic, honey has to uh, meet the certain criteria, right? So the bees that forage cannot have been in contact with any floral source or any forage that has been exposed to synthetic fertilizers or pesticides. So the trick with that is for a plant to be certified organic or for a farm to be certified organic, they have to do that for three years. And the trick with honeybees is they travel a long way. So their hive might be in the middle of a field, but in Danielle can tell me we've heard up to five miles they can forage for a floral source that they like. So we can't ensure in the United States for, for the most case that the bees aren't traveling across someone's yard or gone into another pasture that has you know, been exposed to those. So organic honey in the US is very difficult to come by. Um, we do get most of the organic honey that we receive in the United States from South America. Brazil is probably the largest importer um, or exporter of organic honey to the United States. Your next question was pasteurized honey. Was that what you were? Yes, wondering? it's regular uh, so, honey pasteurized. Yeah, traditionally honey is not pasteurized. Um, that's used in different processing to kill different types of bacteria that are not a problem with honey. Usually honey is heated in the um, processing to remove wax and bee parts and wings and other things that get into the honey through extraction. So it's heated, it's strained, and then it's bottled. And that's usually the process most um, honey um, producers will use. So related to this is a question about whether um, nutrition, there's nutrition differences between the conventional honey and raw honey. So I'll take a shot at that really quick. Um, so the honey board actually did um, a study a while ago and they looked at the variation in some minerals, pollen, and um, also the antioxidant activity of 
a single batch of honey that was then some of it kept raw and some was processed. And as, as dietitians, you all know that there's a huge variation in products that are natural products between products, but what they learned is even within a big batch of honey, there's variation in those three components. And so then if you look at the difference in variation or levels, I should say, of the raw um, versus the exact same batch before it was uh, or after it was processed, um, there was actually a slight increase in the antioxidant activity that has to do with the filtering process. Um, there was, of course, a reduction in pollen because that's the, in, uh, the part of the process is to remove some of those uh, extraneous items that are not a, a part of honey necessarily. And um, the, so the moral of the story is that uh, if you're going to, if you want pollen, you probably need to be buying pollen. There's actually no demonstrated health benefits. Um, but if you are eating regular honey, you're getting the nutritional benefits uh, per se, which is mostly uh, carbohydrates, but a small amount of the minerals and the antioxidants, not a problem. All right, so with that, we're gonna ask um, Margaret to address one other question that came up. It was uh, about whether or not, how do, how do uh, people make sure that the honey that they buy is pure and unaltered with one example being that they'd heard that sometimes sugar could be added. Right. So um, the honey industry, um, like all sort of premium industries, does a lot of testing of honey. So the industry spends millions of dollars every year testing honey to ensure that the product that's on the shelf and that you guys are getting uh, purchasing from uh, legitimate retailers is be perfectly beautiful, pure honey. So we encourage people to buy honey from uh, sources that they recognize and sources that they trust and know that that honey is 100% pure and delicious to consume. Um, we also know that people like to buy it from local folks and folks they know, and that's great. We just trust it, buy honey from a trusted source, I guess is our best advice for ensuring the honey that you purchase is pure. And expiration date, any expiration date on honey? No, they found it in the Pharaoh's tombs, I think. And, and at some point, I guess it was still edible if that was something you wanted to do. So um, lasts forever. And it does crystallize, right? People are very familiar with that. And, and that's just the process that happens over time. Sometimes it will darken in color a little bit over time. So, so uh, all you need to do is warm it up a little bit and it should become very viscous and, and able to use again um, easily. Thank you. Danielle, I'm going to have kind of a series of questions I've grouped together here. So let's just start with, uh, in summary, what are some actionable solutions that you could share with how individuals could um, help protect honeybees? Well, um, each one of us has uh, a yard or a balcony. And I think if you plant, if you plant flowers, the bees will find it. Like Margaret said, and this is um, I think I, I looked at some of the questions. There was a little bit of confusion about the competing flowers. Uh, one hive of honeybees can have 60,000 individuals. So um, I just like the, the power on the landscape of that hive is awesome. So you don't have to worry that one flower is going to get pollinated and the other won't. The bees, if it's good, they will find it. Uh, my point was that flowers all need bees so much that they look the way they do and they present the way they do to make sure that they get attention from bees. So if you plant even just a pot of flowers on your balcony, you're going to see a variety of species of bees come and find it. And like on the screen, this sunflower, that's a great way for you to see what bees are in your yard is just plant a few sunflowers. They stay out of the way, they can be on the edge and bees really love them. So providing flowers for bees and making sure that you don't put anything that would harm bees. Like um, if you're spraying pesticides for other reasons, the bees are flying during the day. So you can avoid hitting any pollinators and accidental exposures just by not spraying when bees are flying and choosing pesticides that are less toxic to bees. That's all information that's online. Um, and of course, buying honey and supporting beekeepers really makes a big difference to them and the bees that they care for. So, you know, you brought up something about pesticides because we did have a question about that. And, you know, a lot of times people are trying to figure out what the benefit of eating organic foods are. So they're shopping at the grocery store and they're like, well, is organic good for the farmer? Is organic good for the ground? Is it good for me? In this case, uh, is, is buying organic shown to actually be good for bees? Um, well, I think... I can't say overall for bees. Um, there are a lot of crops. So for example, 
the carrot seed pollination in Oregon, carrots are pretty intensively treated to keep those seeds safe. And that's a very hard crop for bees to pollinate because there's so much pest management. So in some cases, you, the, the beekeeper knows this is a high pressure place for bees to do their work. Um, you know, you've got the perks of what the flowers are offering offset by what the management has to be in order to get that crop. And so there's always a balance. But in general, I do think that if it harms insects, and often that's what a pesticide is intended to, to protect your own garden resources from a grasshopper, for example, it probably could also harm pollinators. So just being very conscious of if the wind is blowing, like make sure that what if you're using that, you're using it as a last resort, you're using the least toxic version, and you're following the usage instructions, which are the law, and are also taken into account how to protect are beneficial insects so that you're not accidentally harming them just by trying to protect your garden. So I think that the, it, the responsibility is on the person that's using those things. And there are a lot of things in your control to the choices you make about how you use it and what you pick. So Thank that's you. a long answer, but if it harms insects, it's probably dangerous for bees. Yeah, okay. Um, so we had several questions that came in from different angles uh, around immune function and honey. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to group a bunch of them together. Here we go. Um, how might honey enhance immunity? Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is suggest that there's kind of two different categories here that, that uh, are relevant. And the first is the kind of home remedy area. So there's um, very good evidence and WHO recommends as well as um, physicians that um, honey can be used as a non-drug alternative to um, managing cough when you have an upper respiratory infection. Uh, so you're trying to minimize the amount of antibiotics you're giving um, kids. You're trying to minimize the amount of uh, medications and a teaspoon of honey or some sort of honey syrup is actually recommended um, as a home remedy for cough um, suppression in upper res respiratory infection. And someone asked specifically about Manuka and Manuka honey is a very specialized form of honey. It has been shown to help when topically applied to wounds to help with healing. Um, and it also has, um, you know, so it has antimicrobial as well as some wound healing properties, right? So that's kind of the top line for the home remedy uh, perspective. Uh, so what about general immune support? I know everyone's getting all these questions with COVID and everybody's trying to take better care of themselves. Um, so honey actually has um, antioxidants, which is part of the immune system, but it also interestingly may be a part of maintaining a healthy digestive system. And the digestive system is kind of your first line of defense in the immune system. Um, so the idea here is that um, it may provide some of the uh, prebiotics that protect the beneficial or feed the beneficial bacteria in your di digestive system. In fact, off topic from uh, Mediterranean diet specifically, but uh, we've actually funded some research and it's shown that in a test tube situation, um, honey of uh, uh, particular varieties can help the probiotics survive through the um, conditions of the stomach and the small intestine, because when you eat a probiotic, a lot of that beneficial bacteria gets killed off by the acid in the stomach and by uh, the small intestine and eating it with honey uh, may offer some protection to the probiotic to help the probiotic bug actually get uh, to the large colon in large amounts. So the answer is yes, that the, uh, that honey may play a role in immunity, both in traditional um, home remedies, as well as possibly through the digestive system. And the question came in of whether there's different prebiotic levels, uh, depending on the honey. And that's something we're just starting to learn more about. And um, you, we, you would expect that may be true because they're going to be dependent on the specific um, sugars, but there's also some evidence that certain flavonoids play a role in the, um, in the digestive health as well. So to be determined, good question and stay tuned on that one. All right, so from there, we're gonna go to Francine. Uh, Francine, uh, I know you gave some advice at the end, but let's just come back to you for a minute and, and have you summarize, kind of recap some specific advice you might give the supermarket professional about translating your research into motivating behaviors to get help consumers eat a more consistent Mediterranean style diet. 
Thanks, Barbara. I mean, that's a great question. I think what my, you know, preliminary analysis thus far has shown, Americans, their needs, they need to eat better. And the Mediterranean diet as the science, you know, scientific advisory council is a way to do that. And not many Americans are currently doing that. And that's because there's low consumption of traditional Mediterranean foods. And so in terms of, you know, translating to the grocery stores, I think what I'd mentioned, um, simple swaps, right, to make it easier to, you know, very easy to understand. And, um, and you know, there is an overconsumption of meat, right? That is, that, that's one way. They're not scoring high on Mediterranean because there are certain foods that are overconsumed and that starchy vegetables, meat. And so in terms of, you know, practice, you could, really stress the need to really decrease, go to the grocery store and think about better choices that th there are better choices instead of red meats, deli meats, right? There's lean fish, you know, there's a lot of plant-based products that are very, you know, really good and substantial these days, right? So I think translating in the grocery store is to make make better choices um, knowing or for your clients knowing that there is definite room for improvement in terms of overconsumption of certain foods and underconsumption. And of course, you know, what's how I study behavior change as well, especially in dietary practices, you need to make it as easy as possible. And that's like the basis of the basis of my research is that how can we make these swaps even more easy or to, to, you know, incorporate into their diet. And we think honey could be it, especially if you, I mean, to me, it's a win-win taking into account what Barbara said, this preliminary um, research, it protects probiotics, right? So on the inside, but also it just makes things taste better. <laughs> so using honey um, is a win-win, right? All right. Thank you. So we're going to wrap up with this. Um, there were several questions we didn't get to, including um, some around the role of honey in a diabetic diet and uh, body weight management. So I would just encourage that you um, look at the uh, National Honey Board's website. There are lots of materials there for you. And if you still have questions that are unanswered about that, if you could just, um, I think the plan was they can email um, there's email addresses provided, and um, if they need help, we'll, we'll help them out as well. But thank you very much to our speakers. Um, thank you to you for participating. Thank you to Old Ways for hosting, and thank you for, to Margaret for answering our uh, questions. With that, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Have a good day. Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.